welcome to uh, the latest in the IMAP uh, series of webinars. Um, today we're um, uh, pleased to be able to bring uh, Roger Walling from Ralton Asset Management um, to talk to us about what to look for in an SMA. Uh, Ralton Asset Management are or the longest established um, investment manager in specialising in managed accounts. Uh, I remember from the very early days after the release of the MDA class order in 2004, Ralton saying this is something we want to be in. So there'd be few other organisations who've uh, been able to say that they've been continuously in the managed account business for nearly 15 years. Um, Ralton are a, uh, a manager that specialises in managed accounts um, with $500 million or so of money managed in a variety um, of styles um, and, uh, and for a num in a number of uh, structures. So three portfolios, and uh, Roger will talk a little more about this, uh, all in the Australian equity area. Um, for institutional clients, for retail clients through eight platforms, and then directly for a number of wholesale clients. Uh, there's a pun in today's title, of course, because um, Roger, uh, while he's currently portfolio manager for um, Ralton Asset Management, and I'm sure he's heard this pun before, um, in fact is uh, by origin an optometrist. So who better uh, to talk to us about, um, about uh, what to look for in an SMA than somebody with a degree um, in optometry? So uh, Rog, I'll introduce Roger in, uh, in just a moment. Um, and then to close out today's session, Craig Jocelyn from IOOF, the host of these webinar series, um, will say a little about IOOF and its involvement in, in managed accounts. So Roger joined Ralton in 2006 um, and brings over 15 years of funds management experience um, to, to them. Uh, he's responsible for stock coverage across a number of uh, industry sectors um, and assists Andrew Stanley, the Chief Investment Officer, in managing Ralton's portfolios. Um, prior to joining Ralton, Roger was a Senior Analyst at Cinnabar Equities, uh, where he had subsector um, and stock investment uh, decision-making responsibility. Um, so uh, before I ask Roger to, um, to talk to the, about today's topic, I wanted to talk a little about the upcoming events um, that IMAP is holding. And you'll see on the screen um, uh, that we have a lot of activity over the rest of the year. One of the things I wanted to talk particularly about is Managed Account Central. Um, IMAP has uh, three or four years in a row taken um, a large stand at the FPA um, and shared that amongst uh, managed account providers, both MDA and platforms, and investment managers with, um, with uh, investment portfolios accessible through managed accounts. Um, this year will be the largest um, exhibitor at the FPA, um, and we'll have eight participants sharing managed account central. IMAP will produce a managed account handbook, um, and each participant will have uh, their own space on the stand, their own branding, uh, their own advertising and marketing material, and the opportunity to talk to the over 1,000 participants who will be attending the FPA conference. Five of the eight spots are already spoken for, so if you're interested um, in participating in Managed Account Central and being part of a cooperative promotion of managed accounts to the 1,000 or so advisors who will be in Hobart in November, um, feel free to give me or Jane McElroy from IMAP um, a call or an email. The other major thing we have coming up in, in December is Investec. Um, a number of you will have heard me say that the, one of the key drivers of the development of managed accounts um, has been the availability of technology for actually running in a systematic way hundreds or thousands of portfolios. Um, and Investec is a first for us. It's an opportunity to display 
portfolio management technology and connectivity technology um, to place the technology offerings um, in the context of the business processes that managed account advisors, investment managers, managed account providers uh, have. Um, I count over 40 separate technology offers that you could broadly say are portfolio management technology. And I'm really looking forward to Investec as a way of seeing um, what is really the key uh, driver of the development of, of managed accounts. Um, we have the investment forum coming up for dealer group researchers, independent researchers, and on October the 30th, uh, we'll have a, uh, a portfolio manager from Morningstar talking about their portfolio construction process, and Steve Romich from Dimensional, uh, from DFS, sorry, from DFS Advisory Services in Melbourne will talk about the managed account process that's, that they've used in their business for over 10 years now. Um, on the screen also, you'll see a number of our other events. So, um, without further ado, let me hand over to Roger Walling from uh, Ralton to talk about what to look for um, in an SMA. Roger, welcome to IMAP. Uh, great, uh, great, Toby. Thanks, thanks for your time and thanks for the uh, invitation from IMAP to speak. Thanks also to IWF for kindly hosting and thanks everyone for, for tuning in. Uh, so as, as Toby explained, our, our business has been you know, intimately involved in managed accounts for, for 15 years. Uh, myself uh, joining the business you know, 11 years ago. Uh, so today's presentation and, and webinar is obviously really about explaining our perspectives and what you should look for in a managed account when, when making that decision. Uh, and it, it hopefully I'll give you some interesting examples and some detail around how that impacts not only advisors but platforms, uh, clients and, and, and dealer groups in that regard. So just turning to the, the next slide, and this is really just the first few slides, a little bit of a recap, a little bit of a refresh in terms of what managed accounts are and, and how we see the, the different perspectives. Uh, if you start on, on, on the left, is on the screen, there's the, the circle with direct equities on it. Um, obviously, that's fairly self-explanatory. The point to highlight is often direct equities sit outside a, an advisor's remit. They could be uh, legacy situations or other. So um, part of managed accounts does enable you know, advisors and dealer groups to bring um, some of that uh, client sort of thumb on, on under their care. Um, there's then, if you, as, as you shift in the arrow there, you look towards individually managed accounts, which you know, several years ago we really started or morphed from you know, your stockbroker type account into perhaps a more 15, 20 stock portfolio type affair. Often for high net worth individuals, often you know, reasonably high administration costs, a back office with, with stamp, stamp licking and the like. Uh, on the far right, you've then got the sort of unit trust, which has obviously you know, dominated the Australian landscape for some time. Um, you know, professionally managed, um, you know, low entry in terms of balance or other, but you are part of that sort of pooled vehicle. And in the centre then where we've seen, we're using the word efficiencies is what we see as managed accounts, which have been very popular in the United States for a number of years. Um, your large house brokers, your Morgan Stanleys, JP Morgans tended to dominate that space as, as they moved a number of years ago from a sort of stockbroker type example. So if I turn uh, to the next slide, uh, talking here just to sort of some industry statistics, obviously 20% um, of the industry uh, in terms of advisors are now using managed accounts. I think we were talking before that that's uh, moving from not just sort of occasional use to, to what we would suggest will be a sort of the core part of uh, you know, client portfolios. Um, you're seeing an increased use in expectations of uh, advisors that don't use it who, who will move towards that. And you're also, uh, you know, in, in terms of projections, we're seeing that nearly a quarter of thumb in the market, you know, 24% will have moved towards that. So what's driving that? Uh, look, I think most listeners would be reasonably familiar with the concept. It's certainly the concepts around transparency. Clients want this, they want to understand their own tax position and the like. And it's also not just transparency of holdings, but trans transparency of fees. In terms of advisor business models, the move towards um, fee simplicity, fee for service, FOFA's requirements, uh, individual licensing, MDAs has certainly been a, a positive dynamic which has um, made the use of uh, uh, managed accounts more efficient. And in terms of technology, look, there are now probably eight 
um, plus platforms on the market which are mainstream, IWF launching its own um, version shortly. Uh, and those technologies are uh, advanced, low cost, but they're also probably broader platforms than the initial managed accounts which were um, first launched. In other words, you, you know, in terms of other products and services which are available. Uh, again, a little bit of a recap slide, the differences between managed accounts and unit trusts. Uh, managed accounts, clearly you have, uh, you own the shares in your own name and you have your own uh, tax position. That's certainly been uh, a key driver. And you see your own dividends franking come through. You also have portability, so if you don't like your current managed account model provider such as ourselves, you can actually transfer the shares to another uh, manager. We don't obviously suggest you do that. But it's certainly a facility which is available. On the unit trust side, again, I think most people are familiar with that. You're a, you're a unit holder, you have the unit trust tax position, um, and you see the unit price on a daily basis. And then for those that like things in a more pictorial form, this slide um, is somewhat a reiteration of the previous one. The, the two extra points I'd highlight is that your managed accounts are still customizable, so you can uh, actually make adjustments within the portfolio. You can, if clients still wish to hang on to various stocks, they can still hold them on platform outside the model if they see fit. And they can also in, you know, insist that they don't own various stocks or sectors for, for whatever reason they have. So moving a little bit more into the sort of crux of the portfolio and now sitting there with uh, you know, the advisor's hat on and saying um, how do we look at uh, managed accounts and why would we choose them uh, and, and how do we sort of um, walk through that story both in terms of our clients and ourselves. I think the, the best way we think about it is managed accounts are direct equity simplified. So for clients that still like that exposure, they get uh, the benefit of still holding stocks in their own name and that um, contactability with what they see. Um, your, your investors are looking for then you know, performance, the transparency, the connectivity, um, regular communication we see is, is important and I will go back and discuss some of these points in more detail. It should be more efficient, it should involve less paperwork for both uh, investors and advisors um, and for the end investor and sometimes for the advisor who may have been managing some of these stock portfolios, it certainly should be a release of um, responsibility in, in terms of their day-to-day -day tasks. And we hope that certainly advisors can see it as a value-added tool that they can offer to their clients and their practices in turn. So what to look for, and this slide's really the, the summary of what um, the core of the presentation is about. Um, we've highlighted sort of four um, categories that we see are key to in selecting a managed account provider. In effect, these are the questions you should ask to anyone who you're considering in, in terms of use, um, performance, intellectual property, um, their own investment style, and, and the expertise in SMA category and, and the support that they bring to the table. Um, there's some overlap in the facets underneath each of, the, each of these segments which we can talk to. Um, and, and hopefully by the end of this you'll have a fairly clear picture of, of certainly what we look for. So first and foremost is uh, performance. Um, so, and that should obviously be the integral to the choice you make with any uh, investment manager. Um, I'd highlight then a few spe specific comments within that. First of all being you know, returns. You absolutely should be delivering you know, the returns, your state, um, whatever your market-based objectives are, that's important. We also think that risk-adjusted returns are important too. Your clients do, in this environment, get to see all of their shares and they may not thank you for uh, picking a stock which does very well uh, and goes up however many fold, but they'll certainly be more likely to contact you and ask questions in regard to those that don't. So having stocks in the portfolio um, with the right risk-adjusted returns and across the portfolio having that balance we think is important. Consistency re of returns is also critical, um, that you do perform across all periods. Again, your end client can see the returns and they will perhaps have a heightened focus on their returns than they would in a vehicle which they may not otherwise see. We see that more as an advantage uh, and a disadvantage, but in communication we'll sort of highlight where we feel the sort of the boundary is there. Within that, it's that sort of low volatility. Again, your, your investors, if they're typically you know, uh, more sophisticated, slightly higher net worth, um, they obviously want to, often retirees, they don't necessarily want the wild gyrations of the market. So lower volatility is important. Um, 
I give that my wife's uncle's tests. They're all uh, retired uncles and aunts. Um, and your common family barbecues, often as a fund manager, you do get quizzed on what's going on in the market and why this stock's going up, which is all great. I mean, we love what we do. Um, but one of them said to me once, it's actually sleep at night, holiday more often is what they say is what they're wanting to achieve. And I think it's a fair thing in terms of looking at their portfolio and understanding that, um, you know, if there's sort of negativity in the press in the market, that hopefully their portfolio rides through those gyrations. Uh, the two other points I make just uh, underneath that, uh, which I'm struggling to see on the board, uh, uh, to avoid surprises, which I think is endemic in that sort of low volatility uh, type comment. Um, so part of the investments that we seek to make should be uh, lesser volatility. They're not the stocks which we hope to be on the front page of the paper for all the wrong reasons. They're not the stocks which we think have a higher risk of earnings downgrades. Um, and so they're, you know, across the portfolio, we seek to get that sort of balance right. I'll mention the point across all clients. I think that's an important consideration. And I'll sort of highlight where that is important in the next sector, next segment, which uh, on uh, that third circle there is for low turnover. Um, low turnover is always worth defining. What does it actually mean? So your fund manager mentality um, is that anything less than probably 50% turnover in, in the portfolio per year is, is actually reasonably low. Um, but where you're often taking your clients from as advisors is actually potentially a lot less. They may well have inherited their mum's BHP shares, they may well have got some CSL shares in the IPO, in which case well done, um, and they may have just got some Medibank shares because they're a member of Medibank Private. So their idea of turnover a year could well be zero. So you're taking them from an environment where they own these shares, they watch them occasionally, to somewhere where they're all of a sudden going to see the transactions. So having that low turnover, we feel, is, is important and, and also communicating to your clients that you know, things will slightly change on that score. Volume and value of, of uh, transactions is also important, we feel. So um, whereas your sort of uh, unit trust uh, type vehicle may well be placing trades every day as the portfolio, as, as the unit trust receives inflows and outflows, our environment's very, dif very different. So we often suggest that the frequency of trades is, is important. So we would typically trade, say, one to three times a month on each portfolio. So your client isn't seeing sort of daily activity should they choose to look. Um, and within that, if you're not going to have high turnover, you need to be uh, uh, investing in stocks where there's usually a longer holding period. Uh, that obviously then feeds through to tax efficiencies, which varies by vehicle depending on your superannuation or other status. I put there the words optimised communications. One um, fear which uh, some advisors and dealer groups may have is that by moving their clients to managed accounts, they, their client sees everything that goes on and they actually sort of, um, the communication barrier ri rises. Well, often um, we've ha we're hopefully taking uh, some of the efficiencies um, in-house or uh, away from uh, what you do in the back office, so hopefully that is a time saving. But we also believe it's really important that we communicate what we do in a portfolio setting, A, regularly and, and B, in a good style. And I use the term digestible content because you need to be, you know, we hopefully provide communication on a regular basis which you can then directly to communicate to your clients. Having said that clients look at their portfolio and they want to understand it, I would highlight that it's probably your sort of five, 10% of clients that do um, genuinely inquire about what's going on on a regular basis. And again, hopefully if you deliver good performance, people are less, less likely to inquire. Um, we are often asked whether um, people would like real-time communication. We bought this stock today. We're sending you a note to explain why. Look, I think that's, um, that's a facility we do um, cater for some platforms. Uh, our experience thus far is it, it's not utilised that high, but it is some, an option which exists out there. The final circle on the performance page is mandate. Um, and I think the key is, as a fund manager is always to deliver in line with your mandate to uh, say you're going to do X and, and do it. Um, but the transparency again makes that absolutely uh, 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 an imperative. So whether or not you're doing growth or yield or small caps, it's readily evident to every investor um, who, you know, invests, uh, who you invest money on their behalf to sort of follow that lead. So that's an important consideration. The second thing, and possibly the most um, important slide in the pres presentation, relates to intellectual property. Um, and I think this is the point where you need to, in any um, manager who's going to operate in the managed account space, you need to be asking them and understanding how have they adapted 
their process to operate in an SMA um, environment? And can they deliver the same returns as they would in their current processes in an SMA environment? Um, so to talk to, and yes, it, it's somewhat pro-Rolton in some senses, because this is what we've done. This is our heritage and our history across um, 15 years. Um, this is sort of the IP which we think we bring to the table in managed accounts. Um, I highlight a trading platform, and as Toby suggested earlier, we operate across eight platforms. It's imperative that we can transact equally such that um, client equality across all those platforms that, so that they receive effectively the same dealing or trading price when we elect to move within stocks on a given day or over two days, etc. So um, having an inbuilt system which uh, is our own uh, IP which efficiently and effectively deals with um, sending instructions to all platforms within all their timeline, timelines for all the small nuances of those platforms is very important because it means um, that our brand is, is protected in that regard and that we can say this is our performance and this is what was delivered across various pools. Um, the second circle I highlight there is in terms of liquidity. Uh, this is quite uh, a sort of sophisticated part of what we do and it's as much as what we don't own as, as what we do own. Um, so in this sense, uh, we have reasonable hurdles in terms of market cap and liquidity. So you cannot get into our investment universe unless you have a minimum market cap and a minimum uh, daily liquidity. And that's for the similar reasons I just discussed, because if multiple clients are entering our models on a given day or we're making an outright transaction, we don't want to be moving the price in a material manner. It's not good for us, it's not good for advisors, it's not good for their clients in terms of the um, performance that gets delivered. Um, and again, that's a critical element, we think, in terms of client equality. SMAs are becoming more popular, and I do get frequent calls from my colleagues, fund managers, friends, who say, oh, look, we're looking at doing SMAs, and I'm just wondering how you buy this stock. And the short answer is you don't, um, because you can't buy it, because it trades um, you know, largely by appointment. So that is um, a, a benefit of what we bring to the table and the performance we've delivered. So trading positions is somewhat a derivative of that. Um, so uh, the first point there is back solve to be meaningful. I think if your clients look at their accounts and, and you know, the minimum balance in some platforms is 20 or 25,000, obviously people have a lot more invested. We like to think that the minimum investments are certainly a material sort of dollar amount. And so we do recommend that people sort of set minimum trading positions on the portfolios at you know, so around $300. And so our position sizes are generally geared towards ensuring um, those two acts there that you know, at a minimum we're often purchasing 1.5% of the portfolio and, and trading in certain slightly smaller amounts, such that each time that happens it is um, meaningful to the client. Obviously the transaction fees are low because you pay a percentage, very low percentage brokerage, um, but certainly that meaningful concept is important. And again, that value, um, not volume, is, is key. And you can think if you're making those sorts of positions, it, it actually must align with your investment process, which is another um, sort of overlap I'll get to uh, later. Corporate actions is a fairly simple one, and I think one which advisors would be thankful is taken off their hands. So as the manager, we make those corporate decisions on, on all clients' behalf. And it's important operating across multiple platforms that we have processes to deal with that. And how do we make sure this is all correct, that we are actually delivering sort of uh, client equality, if you like, across multiple platforms? We do have an in-house audit process which actually checks each platform uh, on a you know, weekly or earlier basis just to confirm that our models are actually being executed down to the, down to the client level. So that's intellectual property. Um, investment style, I think, is also critical. I think there's a number of um, misnomers in the market, perhaps, about what investment styles are suited to SMA. Um, we are seeing, as I think, more people choose us as their sort of core offering, which is great. I think the, the number of stocks is a very important concept. Um, we're, a, you know, we're a concentrated high conviction manager. Um, in, your, in, in your prior, in, in fact, in Rolton's prior history, and in fact, in um, some managed accounts today, um, managers are electing to operate with a concentrated portfolio, 15 to 20 stocks. Um, that's great, um, I, I think, if, if people choose to operate in that manner. What our history would suggest is that that does increase volatility. So the, if you think 15 stocks, you're going to have an average holding of 5 6%. Um, some higher, some lower, obviously. And it does introduce single stock risk into the portfolio. And, and there will be a point where some of those stocks investments disappoint, um, external news factors or other. So we think that's just a, a lowish number which introduces more volatility to your client outcomes. Um, above 40, I think you move into the space where 
um, you're less of a conviction manager and you go back to those minimum holdings and you'll actually start to lower the amount of shares which are traded. And again, we think that for clients to feel they're getting a uh, bang for their buck in terms of an active manager, we think the sweet spot is somewhere around 30, and which is coincidentally where, where we offer, where we operate, I should say. The next um, uh, concept here is, is, is low volatility. I, I have to sort of discuss that in some other points. Again, I think that's important that your fund manager has good risk management process, that that's a core part of what they do, um, and that that feeds again into having sort of 30 or so stocks, um, which again allows you to own some smaller positions where perhaps the risk is a little bit higher, but ultimately you see the risk reward as being balanced. So we think that volatility is delivered by um, your process and, and the sort of design of the portfolio. Um, if I go to um, the next consideration, it's on, it's on mandate considerations outright. Look, again, I think most managers can operate in this space. I'd say most styles can operate. I wouldn't say that just what we do is the only way to do things by any means. You can be large cap, small cap, um, international. You can be growth. You can be income based. Um, I would suggest that it's, it's, it, it's biased towards more concentrated portfolios. Again, re somewhat repeating earlier comments. And, um, stocks and investments or like hybrids and microcaps it's certainly not suited to which again is that liquidity hurdle and other. And Rolton what are the specifics we think which are suited about our style to um, to operating in the managed account space? Um, we're a thematic value investor so both of those um, attributes we think enable us to hold stocks for longer periods and therefore drive lower turnover. So themes are often long dated where we find a supportive theme, it perhaps can run from several years, be it an international or a local or an industry theme, and therefore you can own stocks for a number of years because they should be supported by those tailwinds. And then on the value side, obviously typically you are um, uh, pushing into the breeze, going against the grain, and so therefore you're often holding stocks for a period um, of you know, perhaps less performance until a time when ultimately the value is realised. So we think both those attributes favour um, the way we operate. Uh, in terms of intellectual property, um, we, oh sorry I've gone the wrong way, excuse me. Um, so in terms of SMA expertise, there's a little bit of overlap in what I've said, said previously. Um, so obviously we feel it's important to have some of these uh, uh, SMA qualities in-house, to have history, to understand portfolio and, and trading and other. Um, we feel uh, that's something we bring to the table which is, which is differentiated. We'd extend that also to saying it it includes uh, the support staff. It's all right me standing in front of the camera and, and, and saying this is how our portfolio works and operates, but it's actually um, the distribution team of any fund manager and what knowledge they bring to the table in terms of the way different platforms operate, the way different platforms onboard clients, um, the treatment of cash um, and, and other considerations, dividends within the portfolio. We have a small example of that uh, early on. Um, so I think it's important that you, you know, the people that operate with us, um, the Copia team in, in this case, um, bring that to the table. And then platform knowledge, which is really an extension of that such that we can educate advisors as to, you know, appropriate choice of platform um, when they may be making those considerations and choices. So what not to look for? I'm absolutely not here to sort of uh, suggest that um, uh, what we do is, is absolutely the only way to do things. I think that I would highlight that um, managers that attempt to um, simply transfer their intellectual property from um, unit trust space into managed accounts will struggle. You absolutely need to adapt your processes and make adaptations. Um, our business has been the beneficiary in some sense of um, uh, other managers that have operated in the managed account space and that have sent through uh, their portfolios with a lag to unit trusts or other, and ultimately the platforms have been the ones that decided to sort of preference us and to also um, you know, perhaps ask um, various other managers that you know, they need to either change or, or move somewhere else. So I would encourage um, uh, advisors to ask those questions to understand exactly what managers bring to the table in terms of that, their intellectual property. So really all the points we've just conveyed. In terms of our expertise, uh, look again, I think we have that attractive performance profile. I use the word profile, it, it's not just the outright results which we're very pleased with, but it's also um, that lower volatility which we think is important. We have that in-house intellectual property capability and I think our style and processes are suited to operating in the managed account space. So a few uh, sort of, you know, 
smaller examples of, of what you do and a little bit um, more uh, managed accounts 101 to a degree. Um, important to highlight that when uh, your clients do consider or are being transitioned to accounts, and often we understand it's a whole of practice event um, for advisors or dealer groups, it can be quite a process. Um, there are um, a number of ways you can do that. You can sell down whichever assets you're transferring, or you can actually uh, transfer cash uh, and uh, assets in the form of stocks into the account, and that then uh, those stocks in particular can then move into our model and they may not all be sort of sold down. Some would obviously be, be retained and would obviously retain their capital gains position. So if it is the, um, the BHP shares or the Medibank shares you've inherited recently, you can actually keep those. Turning to here, but this, the one tool we get asked to use a lot and it talks to the sort of support function of what we do. A number of platforms obviously offer this tool as well. It's just that sort of modi model ready, ready calculator. So if you can send uh, through your shares, your client's ownership, um, and obviously the capital base, we can plug them into our model portfolio and highlight the changes that will be made and give them an impression of the tax base. That then often can lead to, you know, if clients are resistant around sort of realising capital gains or other, um, there is the optionality to retain some of those stocks. Another common thing would be executives who just say, look, I own some Orica shares, I work there, um, I'd, I'd like not to own any more, whether we do now or in the future, just to sort of block those out. So those functions, enabling your clients to have that sort of you know, um, efficient user experience as they cross into the managed account world is often um, very helpful. I'm not going to discuss sort of all of these points in detail here. I'd simply highlight um, in terms of drilling down into managed accounts that the, there are some slight nuances in terms of income. Um, so you actually, if you own 500 NAB shares in our model portfolio, when the dividend gets paid, you receive 82 cents per share for that dividend. So that hits your, hits your bank account. Um, it either hits your bank account within the model or within the cash account that sits within the platform. And we do have a small example around that. But you do instantly get the tax credits, the franking credits for those dividends and others. Um, the corporate actions I've highlighted as well. So again, that we deal with those um, unless clients choose to otherwise request or block, which we don't necessarily recommend. Um, and again, costs with you know, managed account platforms are certainly cost efficient and transparent. Uh, this is something which our, our sort of distribution team works quite hard on in terms of understanding and onboarding clients when, when they join. Uh, the key point is really the fact, obviously, as I said, that dividends get paid straight um, to a bank account. The bank account's either the sort of model portfolio or, or that. I think it, um, investors who want to live off that income do need to understand that. So I think one thing our team's very good at is educating people about, you know, choosing options when their clients go in. And you know, most of the platforms, some certainly offer the optionality of sort of a cash sweep from the dividends. And so as the dividends go into a uh, central cash hub, then the clients can then remove those, um, that income to live on. What that means is that then the portfolio rebalances. And so um, to, in order to sort of manage um, the cash weight. So our IP, our model portfolios, assume the dividends are reinvested. It's a small piece, but it's worth understanding such that your client's expectations are met. Most of this, I think, is sort of um, uh, a little repetitious at this point. Um, I think uh, we've highlighted what the advantages of managed accounts and why we feel they are the sort of the ideal investment vehicle. I would, you know, flag to advisors that the communication piece is key. Um, managing that's important. And I think the other thing we'd emphasise is what it actually leads to. It actually leads to a closer relationship between the fund manager and, and the advisor such that they understand our style, they understand what we're doing, and, and over time they develop um, you know, a, a better rapport and, and, and a closeness which we think works well. And in terms of your clients, look, we think they lose the responsibility of managing their own money. Um, it does a allow the advisor to take control of that and to um, bring that within the suite of services they offer. Um, and again, I think most of those points which you can see in the circles have been um, somewhat covered and highlighted before. So as a summary, and I think most people would understand what I'm uh, uh, you know, about to say in terms of summary, it's those sort of four points around performance, intellectual property investment style, and that SMA uh, expertise, which we think we bring to the table, and we think you should be asking any prospective manager as to how um, they operate and whether they cover some of these factors, because it's the uh, it's the, it is the overlap between trading, um, between uh, portfolio style, number of stocks, which is really important, which we think delivers sort of optimal outcomes to clients, which um, hopefully makes uh, everyone happy.
So with that, and a, a thanks to Jane Harris in our office for her work in the presentation, I'd, um, I think we're up to questions. Yes, so um, uh, thanks very much, um, uh, Roger. So uh, questions, if you, if you have questions, feel free to use the chat function um, and those will come through on the, uh, on the screen for us. Um, I have uh, one, Roger, um, you mentioned that you run a small cap um, portfolio um, and, and you talked a little about um, some of the constraints around investing in yep. um, smaller caps for, for liquidity uh, reasons. Um, so would you like to expand a little more on, on how you manage that tension um, yep. and, uh, and whether there's a sort of capacity constraint you think in that portfolio style? Yep, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Toby. Good, good question and one we, we, we do receive. So our small cap portfolio is actually heavily mid-cap biased. Uh, so uh, that's uh, one way that um, certainly enables us to manage that money. And if you go back to the slide with liquidity and market cap, we the liquidity filter is seven million of trading a month um, and the market cap's 250 million a month. We'd have probably two to three stocks in the portfolio at a given time, which was say between 250 and 500 million market cap. So making sure those investments are liquid is critical to that and critical to being able to deliver performance equally across the portfolio. Um, the other sort of uh, style benefit we bring to the table is a sort of thematic or top-down view. And again, it's the, that with the value bias that means often our investments are longer dated. So we're not trading in and out of smaller cap illiquid stocks um, because we're often buying and holding those stocks. So our average holding period is quite long and the use of the themes and the use of the value bias is often sort of integral in that. But the primary filter is the sort of uh, uh, excluding stocks which are less liquid. So um, some of those stocks, they may be um, 50 million market cap, they may be uh, about to be a you know, 10 bagger. Um, we will start to look at those once their liquidity is coming to our universe, etc. So, and over time we've delivered you know, exceptional performance in that space. In terms of the absolute capacity, look, we do have a, uh, a conservative hurdle on that. You know, um, we, we sort of assume 400 million is the market capacity of that small cap fund. Um, so uh, you know, it is probably slightly lower than others but it's something which may evolve over time as, as, as platforms evolve. Um, now there is a, there is a, um, uh, a question on the screen. Um, so um, the first question is um, the relationship between your, um, your approach to portfolio construction and index weights. So do you have rules around your mandates which are you know, index sensitive or do you have um, an absolute uh, uh, an absolute approach to portfolio construction? Yeah, uh, it, it's a good question. Look, we, we have what I would describe is, and certainly is, is, is loose constraints and, and a long way from uh, an, an index type strategy. So um, we would own you know eight stocks in the top 20 at any given point in time. That's not mandated, um, but that's often simply the outcome. Um, so we own uh, 30 stocks. You are a conviction manager, therefore you have to have um, reasonable uh, overweights in those portfolio sensors. Um, that would be my sort of you know core answer in in that regard. Um, and again, because you're concentrated, you know, being close to the index isn't isn't that relevant. The absolute restraints we do have sort of soft sector limits, um, which as I, I stress the word soft, we would we do certainly operate outside those at times. And I think our maximum uh, portfolio position weight is sort of index plus five percent. Or, or three times the, the um, position size if it's above a certain level. So we're not very restrained in that regard is the short answer. <laughs> so. um, now there is, a, there is a question on the screen from a uh, well-known professional who I, I won't name, um, who works for a uh, large research house that I won't name. Um, and he asks, um, you did refer to managing unit trusts as being somewhat of a distraction. Uh, and uh, what sort of distraction were you, were you thinking of? Yeah, okay. That's a good question. So, uh, <laughs> it's almost an inflammatory word, isn't it? So, look, in terms of distraction, I think we'd highlight that um, our style uh, and the number of stocks we own, etc., is all aligned with the, vo with the liquidity, the market cap, the consistency returns in a, in a managed account sector. If you are managing competing interests on a day-to-day -day basis, 
I, I would suggest that would be a challenge. Not necessarily a challenge in that you're not treating one uh, worse or better than the other, but in terms of keeping the performance steady. Your in unit trust has inflows, you can passively reweight or the other, whereas all of our decisions are far more active. Um, and as an example, in the way we think when we wake up in the morning, it's like we own you know two and a half percent of stock. The stock's done very well. Are we still a buyer? Well, absolutely we are. Otherwise, we shouldn't be owning the stock at that weight or even outright because someone's putting their money in that day. So we take that sort of concept quite seriously. And I just think the two, the, the two are certainly different beasts. My prior role was with the unit trust, so I well recognise the differences. Um, now there's a question from, um, from another um, audience member about international SMAs. Now I know Ralton is a, a, an Australian manager, but do you have any views on um, the issues around um, international SMAs and in particular on currency hedging within them? Yeah, okay. Uh, good question. Look, I think ultimately to start with the latter, currency hedging is really comes down to um, your own risk management, your own processes. You can either, one, call the currency and, and run the gauntlet, so to speak, or and you may well have a well-versed and nuanced view in doing that, or you can uh, elect to hedge that. Um, I wouldn't be sure how a derivative or other would hedge your position within a managed account international SMA, um, but there are obviously ways to do that. In terms of international uh, managed accounts, look, 10 years ago, um, the custodial relationships um, weren't that deep either within the platforms or, or cross-border and that was quite a restriction to platforms wanting to or being able to cost-effectively operate it. In other words, you could probably do it but the costs were quite high. Whereas now I think um, it, those costs have come down. There are a number of managed account providers and even sort of stockbroking houses who do offer, who do offer that service. I think they've sort of morphed into the path often of owning or offering your ownership in Apple and Google and, and those things because that gives you exposure to those sort of mega tech stocks. So I think there's a sort of flavour of the month around the stocks in those portfolios. But certainly I think um, it, it is available in a number of forms and I think you want to ask the manager exactly the questions I've highlighted, I'd suggest. Great. Look, thank you very much and thank you to those who did um, <coughs> submit questions. It's now, um, uh, I'd now like to um, hand over just to conclude um, to Craig Jocelyn from IWF to talk a little about um, IWF's approach. Uh, one of the questions that came through, which I was saving for this moment, Craig, is uh, uh, you talked a little about SMAs and we'd like to, to hear about, um, about IWF's approach. Sure, thanks Toby. Uh, IWF are, are happy to be involved as a, as a sponsor of the IMAP uh, webinar series. We, we, we want to facilitate and help increase the knowledge of managed accounts in the industry. Uh, IWF have had a long experience in this area and we now manage over two billion in managed account solutions. Sort of as a, a point of difference in the marketplace, we, we provide choice uh, through a number of platforms. So we have both in-house and platform, external platform partners and we, and we can facilitate choice in terms of managed account structures. Um, so we can help partner with AFSLs to determine and implement a managed account solution uh, appropriate to both their clients and business needs. Uh, and so that's sort of that was uh, uh, sort of my key take out or my key message for today um, without sort of going into more detail. What was the sort of the actual question that you uh -huh. uh, wanted to throw out? Well, the, the question, you, you've pretty much answered it. What, what, where does IWF uh, stand in? Yeah, in so SMA it's, it's all about actually listening to what the AFSLs or the businesses are actually uh, looking for in terms of their business and clients' needs and then making something appropriate in terms of the solution uh, rather than, you know, a, a one-size solution fits all. Great. Look, thank you very much, Craig. So, uh, and to those of you who've... Uh, participated as, uh, uh, as the audience for today's webinar. Thank you very much. I'm showing on screen again the events which IMAP has coming up and we would welcome you participating in those. Um, Managed Account Central, as I say, at the FPA, if you're interested in showcasing your own organisation as a manager, as a managed account provider um, or as a researcher, um, we, have a, we have three spots left out of the eight. Um, there, there'll be a number of both large and small participants um, in Managed Account Central um, showcasing not only each individual participant but the whole of the Managed Account universe. Um, Investec in December on the technology around uh, portfolio management. 
Um, and then specifically coming up on October the 30th, um, the investment forum. Uh, we had well over 100 people participate in Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne in a concurrently video streamed um, inaugural investment forum um, a number of weeks ago. Um, uh, for October the 30th, we're extending to include Perth as well. Um, you can attend Macquarie's offices. Macquarie are the sponsor of the investment forum um, and participate uh, live in the discussion uh, in a particular case uh, with uh, Joel Bloomer from um, uh, Morningstar talking about portfolio construction and direct in their, their approach to direct equity portfolios and Steve Romich from DFS uh, talking about the use of managed accounts in their advice practice. So thanks very much for your participation today. We'll be sending a survey monkey um, uh, feedback uh, survey to all of the attendees today and we'd welcome your feedback uh, both on today's presentation and also on other topics around managed accounts which you'd like to see IMAP present um, in this webinar series. So thanks IWF, thanks Craig for supporting this series. Um, we had uh, well over 100 uh, registrants to attend, so it's clearly um, an area of significant um, interest. Thanks very much, and I look forward to you joining us again uh, for the next IMAP webinar. Thanks.